We are back. A chat with Matt is here. 2022. Happy New Year. Happy holidays to everyone. Hope you had a wonderful holiday season. We're in the midst of another lockdown, which is great. But you know what? Hopefully uh, we'll get out of it sooner rather than later and actually possibly have a full year of shows. But that is yet to be seen. Anyway, for the first time in a bit, we're joined by a nice good old fashioned rock duo. I haven't had a nice little rock duo on here in quite a while. Uh, last one was either. It's probably Crownlands probably. But, but anyway, Mellow Honey, I got Dave and Andrew. Guys, how you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having us. We appreciate this. No, thanks for uh, taking the time to come on and you guys being the first of the year and yeah. it's wonderful. So so talk to me about uh, Mellow Honey. Like, Give me a quick rundown of who you guys are and what you guys do. Uh, well, basically, we, you know, we've been in bands throughout the years. So we kind of took songs that we've had half done or fully done and, you know, from those existing bands and then decided to create a limitation of only two members in the group. So basically taking material we've had before and reworking it into a two piece and trying to come up with as many different uh, interesting dynamic shifts and stuff as possible as a two piece. And then basically we've been doing that for years now. So we've rolled into like writing in that mindset. Right. Yeah. Me and Dave have known each other since high school. That's when we sure. started playing together. Uh, we started in a metal band and then we played in a folk rock band. Um, and uh, now we're here and it's a two piece and it's great because everyone shows up to practice every time. And <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's just, it's just so much easier for playing shows too. It's like you have half the gear. It's just, yeah, it works. It works. So yeah, that's what a lot of people are noticing with two pieces. It's not just that a you get to deal with less people because coordinating a show and i'm sure you guys know this from past experiences coordinating a show with four to five people in a band can just be nightmarish because you know one yeah. guy's got to work and one guy's got a girlfriend at home that can't doesn't want yeah. him on the road this day because oh we got to yeah. go to dance someone's Everyone. always running late too there's always <laughs> one per at least one person's running late and then you're all stressed out yeah gotta so, be on in 10 minutes so you guys prefer the two piece kind of arrangement. Do, do, does it concern you when you're making the music? Because a big issue with a lot of two pieces, if they don't have like the correct setup in terms of like making sure they hit the low end, because usually two pieces are generally guitar and uh, drums and vocals. So talk, what do you guys do to help combat that kind of low end stigma around those two pieces? Um, well, I mean, I, there's a lot of two piece bands that I really like, but I tend to like a lot of the two piece bands that don't fall into the pentatonic riff, sing, pentatonic riff, sing sort of uh, formula. We try to stay away from that. Not that there are bands that don't do that well. There are a lot of good bands. I mean, obviously, Crownlands is a band from around here that, you know, they kind of do that sort of thing, but obviously, they've got a good following and they're super nice guys. So, um, those bands exist that do it well, but I, I find that it, it can be a little bit uh, too di difficult to sound any different. You just sound exactly like the other band. So um, my guitar setup is, uh, well, at least most of the songs are tracked with a 12 string, which I then go into a splitter pedal, which splits into three ways, meaning splits into three amps. One amp is on all the time. One amp gets pushed into an octave pedal, which goes through a bass amp. And then the third amp is like a detuned amp that gets turned on for choruses. So it's essentially like three instruments that get blended in and out. And, you know, I don't really move around on stage too much these days because I have to tap them all myself. So um, from my standpoint, that's the way that I try my best to sound different from every other guitar two piece sort of, you know, player. And I think that and what you brought up is is something that I kind of touch on when it comes to even just the concept of true original music. And, and, and some people don't like it when I when I say this, but it, it is true whether you like it or not. There is no such thing as true original music anymore because every, everything has been done. Everything is a variation of something else. And you can easily trace all music back to a, at least a point of cavemen hitting rocks with sticks. So especially in the rock genre where many bands kind of fall into that mainstream line of like you said the pentatonic riff then chorus and riff and of course it because a it's hard to expand out of that without getting too niche or conceptual that may deter most audiences but at the same time that's what that's where the best creativity kind of comes when you're forced up against the wall feeling like okay i need to figure out a way out of this copy and paste formula that a lot of bands seem to fall under 
So how long have uh, you two known each other then? Because you, you go from, which I also love that, a metal band to a folk rock. That seems exactly the path for most people. They go from yeah. heavy <laughs> to like lighter, and then they find rock, which is usually right in the middle. So talk me through that process. Uh, so I think me and Dave met at my house party that got booked in grade 11. And, and it was hilarious because Dave... I think the police showed up. Dave couldn't find his shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember talking to him that night and he was like, what band were you talking about? You were talking about some like, I don't know, my uh, only... some metal band or something. Cause I was playing drums that night, but that we, we met at my house party. And then after that, I think we spoke a few times in high school and then we ended up forming a band about a year later or something like that. But uh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, funnily enough that night I took someone else's shoes <laughs> which led to a very close ass kicking once I realized and I was, you know, I was like a you know, junior in high school or whatever. So yeah. I took some 12th grader shoes. So. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and so it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Sorry, not, mu not music related, but a good little <laughs> tidbit. So we've had, we've had so many, you yeah. know, Stories are important Stories, when you play in a band yeah, with someone, right? You need some sort like of how chemistry. how we met and everything is pretty yeah. funny. Some, some misadventure, if you will. Right? Misadventure, right? Yeah. Exactly. And that's always interesting. It's interesting when you see these dynamics that you meet people either in high school or like earlier than that. Like I think of Cleopatra, for example, and they've known each other since like kindergarten, I, knowing those guys and seeing that it's interesting to see what musical partnerships kind of make it through almost like a test of time because it takes a few projects in usually for most musicians to realize, okay, if I want to be able to do this, I need to check A, B, and C, and these projects aren't doing it, but we can do it this way and this way it works. Uh, talk to me about what it's been like dealing with being an independent artist during this pandemic, because obviously you, you, you guys had a, like, a couple shows. I saw you play Built More in Oshawa, which is great. Um, and then just, yeah, talk to me about what you're dealing with. Um, we, I, we've definitely been productive throughout this, this time. So Dave built a studio that we're in right now over the summer. So, uh, we've been able to just use of it whenever we want. So we've been recording a lot. Um, we've been trying to be more active on social media. Uh, we've been planning for the summer. We've been applying to festivals, to government grants. There's, there's still plenty to do. I mean, I guess, you know, it, it's fun playing shows and shows often keep the ball rolling and keep you motivated. But we we found a way to keep ourselves motivated by just like recording in the studio and just really focusing on what we want to do in spring, summertime uh, when, you know, the lockdown opens and, and we start playing shows again. Yeah, I think the fact that like we can actually control the recording process, we can control our schedule and and not have to deal with booking stuff and spending hours booking and then finding out that everything has to get moved again anyway. So that's kind of, I think the approach we're taking, um, because that's something we've lacked, you know, and that's, you know, probably mostly my fault. Um, social media has never been my bag, but we're working fairly hard now to get that to be a consistent thing. So, you know, the playing shows and the booking and all that, we want to do that but we fear, you know, having to make that next post. Sorry, this is postponed. Sorry, postponed. Sorry, postponed. So we're just in here working out songs we've had for quite a long time, some new ideas too, and making sure that at least we can control the creative process so that when we do have some sort of idea that, you know, we got six to eight months <laughs> where we can play shows, we've got a new set for people because we were lucky enough to have people come to multiple um, shows, you know, whether or not they're friends or, or new fans, that sort of stuff. So um, just controlling our own destiny at this time. Yeah. Is the name and ready the name. to hit the ground running once everything opens back up. Like we're yeah. just we're fucking oh, yeah, ready yeah, to yeah, go. Yeah.
and, and and that's and that's the challenging thing it's it's having that constant edge of needing to be ready for when things open up because everything is so up in the air because and it's good that you guys have your own studio you're controlling your own time as well as saving a lot of money on recording which is a huge benefit in the south and many musicians who listen to this now uh, with with the way things are going hopefully we can get things going in the spring again but it's very up in the air at the moment and that's and it's and to your point it's no one people are wanting to book things and announce things but especially especially you know in the ontario scene and, not, and even the canadian scene in general most people are still kind of holding off because we're still waiting on that next announcement, whether it's an extension or another few weeks or, what, or whatever it is. And that's what makes it difficult. And that's why this industry is the first to go last to come back because entertainment is, and, and also the topic of appreciation of art has been coming up a lot recently because people are looking at streaming royalties or just how musicians are treated and supported during this pandemic, as opposed to other industries and, yeah, what, what are some of your thoughts on that? Dave, you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, <clears throat> everybody needs to feel safe and feel like, you know, that their safety is um, respected. So I want that to be clear. However, my personal opinion is there's only so many times you can you can close venues down before there will be no more venues. Yeah, before they're permanently closed down, yeah. There was a lot of exciting things happening, especially in our area with, you know, the new Asha Music Hall, the Biltmore being a new venue. I mean, we had a great time there, loved it. Um, you know, um, so I'm hoping there's, you know, some government assistance in that. I mean, they're the ones making the decisions. So it's, it's definitely making me think, you know, we need to control as much of our destiny as possible in terms of can we do live streams from here if we need to? Yeah. Can we, you know, can that sort of, I mean, we did a DIY pop-up show before um, this newest lockdown. So I think, I think it, unfortunately it's going to have, it could be on us. If we want to play live, we're going to have to find out a way to do it. You know, and that's, that's in a, in a doomsday scenario where we, where we can't get back to normal for a while. Um, if we can get back to normal for a while, I mean, yeah, we're going to play as many shows as we possibly can. And, and that's the way you got to really approach it. It's hoping that things get back to normal and just keeping yourselves as ready as possible. So wh what's next for you guys? And then in terms of music, are you working on a new record or you got new singles coming? Like what's going on right now? We've got three songs in the works right now. Um, and just refining our set, just having our set be as powerful from start to finish. Um, tightening it up and just yeah yeah so a couple new songs uh working on the live set um working on some graphic design stuff as well uh the social media we've been working on that really hard just trying to post a few times a week posting content networking with other bands trying to kind of create a community and, and get more involved with other bands um and collaborate and so. we should highlight um content that makes sense for a band to post not memes <laughs> <laughs> not cat yeah. memes like i i you know a lot of not a lot of bands but some bands do it and it's like uh i don't really i'm not following you because i want memes I, I want music content i want to hear your band you know and i i get it do what you want with your social media page it's fine that's just my opinion i think you should just stick to music content that's just my opinion well no i i i do agree with you it, it's the 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 reason why people usually end up going with memes or something in that kind of more general audience kind of format is because they don't know what to post in terms right. of that original content and or things that are related to the music in some way and, and it's a challenge for a lot of bands because mm -hmm. you may you may still be trying to figure out what the messaging of your band is you may still be trying to figure out what is the brand of the band? What what are the things that are good to post in association with the brand? And it's finding that balance between uh, original content, which coming up with original content nowadays, especially when you're limited to what you can and can't do, whether it's a lockdown scenario or, or what have you, it, it's so challenging for these bands because you don't want to have to post the same thing every week or something like that because sure. there's nothing else going on. And, and, 
And what's been the hardest challenge for you guys with social media? Has it been the content creation or just getting to the habit of the management side of things? Because like social media management, trust me, I know firsthand it's a, it's a pain yeah. in the ass and, <laughs> and, it, and being consistent and congruent with what you're doing is just insane. Biggest challenge. I would say uh, just at the beginning, it was, we weren't really getting interaction from anyone outside of our friends. And then we started kind of networking a little bit more meeting other bands that were kind of within our realm of sound. And then I think the secret to it is if you want people to comment and interact with you, you got to interact with them. And we just weren't really doing that at first. So now we're like making a point of like checking out other bands, listening to their music, commenting on their music, commenting on their music gear, asking them when they're playing next. And because it's like, you got to at some point realize that you're in a community of people and we all need to help each other out and we all need to collaborate because like that's the only way you get people to come out to shows because every band knows like the first few shows that you play it's just your friends pretty much coming out and then the other bands and you you want to move beyond that so you have to kind of like go out go to other bands shows even without them inviting you just show up and be like hey we're mellow honey we really liked you guys we should play a show sometime like show face right because it's you, you got to support other people, other people's art. You can't just hope people support your art for nothing. Right. It's kind of the way it goes. No, I absolutely agree. And, and, and something you touched on there is, is, is community essentially supporting community. I, I don't know why the mentality of some of these artists or bands, especially now it, it, it seems to be more competitive either because you're fighting for the same agent, you're fighting for the same attention of a label. You're, you're fighting for the same attention of the audiences, but, Art isn't meant to be a competition. Art is right. meant to be an expressive medium for your soul and who you are as a person and as a performer or a creative being. So you guys going out to those shows and supporting arts is phenomenal to hear. It's, it, weirdly enough, it's also very rare to hear because, yeah. because so many bands don't want to support those other bands because it may make them look better. But the thing is, if you're supporting that band and they like you and they, they'll support you back because right, people, right. people generally aren't assholes. Yeah. I, and I say that, and I use the word generally very <laughs> generally. loosely. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's, it's about putting yourself in the right scenario, putting yourself in front of the right people and making those connections. And like seeing you guys on a show with uh, judgment, shout out to the judgment boys, uh, shout out to excuses and everything they're doing with no accomplice. Congrats to those guys. Seeing you network with those guys makes me very excited to see where you guys are because I, I wasn't familiar with you until oh, you guys shout out. outs, shout outs to excuses, excuses. Cause they were the ones that kind of uh, opened my eyes to like on Instagram, when we played the show with them, they were like Snapchatting us and posting footage of us playing on their social media profile. And I'm like, Oh man, we need to do that too. Like I, I it, it kind of a light bulb went off in my head and I was like, Oh yeah, this is how bands are supposed to collaborate and, and, you know, show community is to support each other like that. So shout yeah, out we had a good time with those two. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, no, shout shout out to Kyle. I, we're from the same uh, school program, so it's good that he's doing oh, yeah. that kind of stuff. But uh, w with with sharing content, and that's and that's the fun thing about social media. And this is kind of what I, I tell all bands, especially when it comes to trying to figure out what to post. It the thing is, everything is content and nothing is content at the same time. It's that weird equilibrium, be, finding that balance because it's like, and, and something you guys touch on as well as reaching out to community and getting personal connection because the biggest thing everyone's looking for right now and, and what the pandemic has made people really crave is that authentic personal connection it's that thing that makes you want to interact with a creator online or 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 with a band and that's and that's the tough thing too most bands have had to force themselves to become social media influencers but they have no interest in being social media influencers they want they yeah. want to go out and play shows and, and make music and focus on that aspect of it because Trust me, before the pandemic, and I'm sure you guys can test this. I know I did. I took I took it all for granted, and I'm like, oh well, most bands are just following the same format and just oh yeah, we post about shows when they happen, and then we'll go do the show. And now it's like, oh god, now we have to be transformative with our content online and figure out how to make people connect through a screen like that. Yeah, yeah. that alone makes it so difficult. It's I think it's all about finding a way to make it work for yourself, right? Because. Yeah, it's like we're not social media influencers, but we realize yeah. that it's a pretty powerful tool, like especially just getting feedback on like song clips, like here's an unreleased song. And then we'll be like, oh, OK, like people are really liking this. Let's let's work on that some more. 
Um, so yeah, no, it's it's been it's been a motivator. We we love like, oh, yeah. having that those little interactions with. It's actually it's tied together. Um, you know, many things that we wanted to do, not necessarily to harness the motivation. That's not the hard part. But it's like okay, well, we need the song to do the video. The video is going to be cut up into social media posts and those social media posts are eventually going to get us back to people listening to the song. So it's this like cyclical thing that like, you know, we always had the ideas for it before, but we never really took the initiative to like start it with social media first being like, we're working on something and then kind of seeing, you know, like, Oh, that's actually kind of working. We're engaging with some people. It's feeling good. Okay. Well now we got to finish it. Okay. We finished it. Now we got to shoot a video for it now. So it's like the cyclical thing that um, has motivated me for sure. And I mean, seriously, Andrew has been, um, you know, the driving force, initially to get it going and i couldn't be happier because it's just you know made a massive difference even just within the last you know yeah. i mean we haven't been doing it for that long we've been a band for a while but we, you know within the past i don't know three four months a penny you were the shit but your love was never made on the counterfeit something money you just can't buy happiness and peace of mind or the time it's up to realize yeah, I dodge a bullet when you pass by lately I think it's funny how if you stuck around I'll be dead or down for me like a motivation to do me right And that actually kind of wants that actually leads me to kind of what I want to bring up next. Every band, especially when they're in that earlier stages and you don't really have anyone on your team yet, it's just you and, and you're doing it all with with a two piece band. Usually with most bands, it comes down to one person doing everything. But uh, are you guys like managing to split up the work evenly or how's that dynamic working? Uh, more or less. Yeah, I would say we're well, I mean, we, we we've been finding a way to enjoy doing it. So we haven't really been looking at it in terms of splitting it up. I think we've just, whatever free time Dave has, he'll work on something and whatever free time I have, I'll start working on something. And we're constantly texting each other throughout the day, just kind of mm -hmm. bouncing ideas off of each other back and forth. Um, so yeah, it, it, in, at the end, it's like, we get a lot done and we don't really think of it as um, a 50, 50 type thing. It's just, we're kind of happy with how much we both get yeah. done. Yeah. And I mean, we've, since day one of this band you know we do all the recording all the mixing all the writing you know we sit and tune the drums to the key of the song before doing it we're setting it up we're tearing it down you know i've heard the song 80 billion times before it gets released you know and and andrew's got all of his notes and what he wants to hear from the song we go through them together so we've been really i mean i'm very lucky 
you know, to have a partner in crime that, you know, I like respect his opinion as well. Like that's, that's a really important thing. I mean, if you, I don't know if you've ever been in a band, but you know, you, you want to respect the person, but you also, and I think more importantly, you want to respect their opinion on what you're doing. It's hard to get respect as a drummer. Yeah. <laughs> that or a bass player it's either or yeah, yeah but you guys yeah, don't yeah. have that problem so you're fine <laughs> yeah no i i I've, I've been in a band so i i completely understand having having that mutual level of respect is so important as well as making sure that everyone's on the same page and, and like i to my, to my earlier point the more band members you have it's like have the more cooks you have in the kitchen the more complicated yeah. the dish is going to get and, and I'm a huge proponent of the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. So if you can do something with two people, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I can do it yeah. because yeah. You, you're going to save a lot of money. <laughs> you're going to save a lot of time and a lot of stress. Uh, if Even, you if, if the scenario came up, though, uh, for whatever, let's say let's say you guys get signed, everything we start, we start raking in the money. Everything's wonderful. Right. Is there any possibility? that you would want to bring in like a third person to help fill out the low end side of things. Like maybe you got a bass player or someone doing synth or keys or something like we've, that. We've you talked about, about this. We've talked about this before. So yeah. I think like right now it's pretty manageable as a two piece. If we were to ever bring in a third person, it would have to be like a multi instrumentalist, someone that's like bass backup vocal synth. But like right now we don't really need that. Um, but yeah, like we're obviously open to, to that yeah future. we would need somebody with a utilitarian mindset um you know um i mean our recording process is strictly based off of okay we have drums let's make the drums singable right singable drum parts so it's almost like you know a, not not like a vocal melody but like a melodic drum part can go a long way and can fill a lot of space you know, so we kind of add that as, as like another instrument, not just keeping a beat, but like, do we have a melodic pattern for certain sections? I don't record guitar parts where I can't play them live, like in terms of like two, two parts, whether or not I perform it well, that's another story. However, it is always feasible to do it as one person, whether or not it's double tracked, doesn't matter. It's double tracked the same part. The bass is doing the same thing as the guitar part. Uh, we have ventured recently into having the bass slightly change up from the guitar. Nothing that would be missed in a live environment. Um, but we are trending in that direction where it's like, you know, it'd be pretty cool if we had a guy playing keys so that like I could relax and worry about the singing and not about the guitar sound and then which amps are on at this time and then the singing. Um, I think that when it comes to that stage where it's like, we, we, I could personally perform much better if we had another person, if we get to that stage, I think that would be the catalyst before anything else. No, I get that. Especially like, cause, cause I see when I see these two pieces, like I always think of, I always go to crown Lance just because their, their music it is in that more progressive, uh, outside, outside of the normal line, especially lately. And just thinking of the stuff Cody has to do vocally and then while doing it on drums. And, and I'm glad that you brought up the fact of making the drums melodic. And I'm, and I'm noticing that a lot more, which is a beautiful thing because drums, and we're going to give some love to the drummers at the moment, not very much, but you know, just enough to make them feel good. Uh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it's important to make a drum part rhythmic, catchy, but memorable. And I think that's where the melodic element comes in because when you make something melodic, it, it's more likely to stick. And, and hearing you guys do that makes me very happy. Appreciate it too. Yeah. I mean, that is absolutely something we work on. It's kind of gotten into a state now where like we think that way, which is great. Um, but we worked on it. I mean, our first single that we released, uh, Man I Want to Be, which came out, I mean, at least a year at least a year or two. Um, I mean, we worked on like every single transition. Like it is better when you hit the floor, Tom. And then the next question. The smallest is, details. Yeah, that. yeah. Why is it better when you hit the floor, Tom? Right. So conversations about all those things, which I'm sure every band has, but at least in our case, it's even more uh, important because, you know. Note by note. Note by note. It's got to, it's, you know. And I mean, I, I feel grateful that most people that are nice enough to come up to us and we, we play, they're always like, damn, you guys are only two people. That's awesome. 
And that was to me, yeah. So that was our goal with like only being a two piece is can we sound as big as the other bands that we're playing with? So we, we try our best to really fill that that space. Yeah, can we sound as big? And will people miss other musicians? And I mean, you could make an argument that there's only two of us to begin with, so they don't know what they're missing. But I think a lot of, I mean, anybody that we've had, you know, a nice conversation with has always been about like, it is so awesome that you guys can do it all with only two people. I don't feel like I'm missing anything. So that to me is the ultimate compliment. Um, you know, for, for, it's just what we strive to do. No, I, I, and I'm also glad to hear that you guys like ask why should it be the floor tom in that scenario like why is that note in that position the way it is whether it's the amount you hit it the tone of the drum itself why the guitar part it's it's giving it's almost giving meaning to why you're playing that note and giving it more meaning makes it come across a lot stronger in the recording process because every musician knows that when that one part hits, you're just like, you get like a chill up your body and everything goes, Ooh, and we, and you just, Oh, oh it feels yeah. so good in your soul and just melts like butter. So the last thing I kind of want to ask you guys before we wrap this up, since this is the first episode of the year and uh, we just came out of uh, the new year's, what are three goals for, what are three new year's resolutions for mellow honey? Let's see. So, Maybe something like like we'd like to hit a thousand followers on Instagram. That would be cool to just have that as as a as a, a goal there. Um, also, maybe play some more Toronto shows. Get out of Durham Regional a little bit. Yeah. What do you think? Um, I think also having having a high quality video to go with one of our singles. I think is is something else that. Um, <clears throat> we would massively benefit from um yeah aside from that i mean we've already hit one of our resolutions which is uh you know work harder yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure for sure oh, that's the main thing it, yeah i'm not getting any younger so <laughs> no we are not <laughs> dave andrew thank you guys for hanging out with me for a little bit this was a great little chat uh where can people find you and what you do dave uh, you know, we're on every streaming platform, which is Mellow Honey, M-E-L-L-O-H-O-N-E-Y. It can be slightly confusing to some people. Um, you know, YouTube, same deal. Um, Instagram, just Mellow Honey. It's, it's an obscure name, so we were able to grab every single, you know, domain um, with that, with no weird numbers or anything after that. So just Mellow Honey, look up Mellow Honey, and there you go. We'll be there. All right. All of uh, Mel Honey's links are going to be in the description down below. Guys, thank you again. Thank you guys for checking out the first episode of the year. And uh, I'll be back with more new episodes soon. Take it easy. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Cheers, buddy.